Welcome everyone. We are so glad you are here. I'm Carrie White. I'm your Zoom host for today. Today in our conversation on making young voters promoting youth engagement in American democracy, we are gonna be hearing from the 2021 Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecturer uh, in Representative Government. And we want you to engage in conversation with her. So as we get started, I do wanna invite you to engage. You of course can use the chat box to have conversations with the panelists, authors, and other participants. Um, but you can also engage on social media about what you're learning. So you see there on your screen, our Facebook and Twitter accounts, we'd love for you to follow along. Also a reminder that you can take control of your own viewing options. At the top of your screen, you'll see either view or view options, depending on which uh, view we are in, whether we're sharing our screen or not, so that you can adjust what you see on your screen. There are gonna be times today where we'll spotlight our presenter or group of panelists and when that concludes, you can then again make choices about whether you're in speaker view or gallery view on your own device. We are going to be using the chat box today, not only for our chit chat back and forth, but also for our Q&A. So if you have a question for our presenter today, would you please start your chat with the word question in all caps? That'll let our moderator know that you're not just throwing out your question for everybody to weigh in on, but specifically to make sure that we can all see it as uh, it comes time for that conversation. If you need technical help, please chat with me, Carrie White or Richard Feinberg. We are noted on your screen as host and co-host. We do want you to know that one of your Zoom tools is for closed captioning. You can turn on this um, live auto transcription of the discussion if that is of benefit to you. If you need help finding that, again, you can let us know in the chat box. We are recording. That means this will be available for you after today's session um, on our YouTube channel. Um, but it does also mean that we are recording your smiling faces. It really helps our panelists and presenters to see your faces while they are um, visiting with you during the Q&A. So if you don't mind leaving your camera on, we'd love for you to do that. But if you are not in a place where you are able to share your camera or don't want your a video recorded, just keep your camera turned off. We also would ask you to, so that we can keep our recordings clean, that you would keep your mic on mute unless you're asked to unmute. And finally, it is the expectation of the University of Oklahoma and all of our partners that everyone today enjoy a welcoming and inclusive environment. So let's do our best to help everyone stay positively engaged and feel a sense of belonging in the conversation. Thank you so much for engaging with us. And now I'll turn things over to Mike to kick us off. All right, thanks, Carrie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, what we're calling the 2021 uh, Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecture on Representative Government. Uh, my name is Michael Crespin. I'm the director and curator of the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center. Uh, the center is proud to host now its 20th Rothbaum Lecture, reflecting our core mission to strengthen representative democracy through engaged and informed citizens. Uh, of course, this year, the lecture is a little bit different. Um, you know, we normally bring our lecturer to Norman, and I know uh, she really wanted to come uh, to, for three days of lectures, dinners, lunches, uh, and other events. And obviously, this year, we're holding the event, the event a bit later um, and decided to move online, given the global pandemic. Um, I want to thank everyone including our lecturer, the staff at the Carl Albert Center, and many others uh, for the ability to perform the dreaded pivot uh, from the in-person event we were planning for the fall uh, to the online events we're having today and tomorrow. Uh, while our lectures are normally live and in-person, uh, this year our lecturer recorded her uh, lectures, and you can watch the extended versions on our YouTube channel. Uh, today, after my brief opening remarks, we'll show a short overview lecture, uh, sort of uh, round, gives an example of the lecture, of the material, and then we'll give the audience time to ask questions. Uh, and tomorrow, we're going to return a little bit earlier at noon to host a roundtable uh, with our speaker and others who practice um, uh, helping make young voters. So the lecture is in resulting books published by uh, the University of Oklahoma Press, honor the lecture's namesake, Julian J. Rothbaum. Julian Rothbaum was a lifetime friend of Speaker Carl Albert, was a leader in civic affairs in Oklahoma and across the nation, and an important su supporter of the University of Oklahoma. 
Uh, Mr. Rothworm served in many leadership positions for the university, along with his wife, Irene, and down professorships and student awards at OU and other universities that Speaker Albert attended. The lecture series serves to promote ideals that Julian held dear in his own life. The importance of education, which enhances the quality of participation in public affairs, cultivation of public service and future political leaders, and the broad-based engagement in private citizens in public affairs. Uh, these ideals are ones we share at the Carl Albert Center, and I hope across the entire university, and we work to achieve them in all of our efforts. Uh, before introducing our lecturer, I want to thank Joel Jankowski, um, who with his mother, Irene Rothbaum, end endowed this lectureship in 1983. Joel worked for Speaker Albert prior to his distinguished career uh, as a lobbyist with Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld in Washington, D.C., and is extremely dedicated to this event. Uh, rather than make an appearance every two years, Joel is with us every step of the way from selecting the lecturer uh, to other important parts of, of the lecture. Um, he's been helpful with us during this pivot. I see Joel in the audience. We're all muted. I'm not going to ask us to unmute and uh, clap for Joel, but Joel, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, the general theme of this year's lecture, Making Young Voters, Promoting Youth Engagement in American Democracy, is both timely and important. It's timely since the 2021 lecture coincides with the 50th anniversary of the 26th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which gives 18-year-olds the right to vote. It's important because young citizens are routinely the least likely to turn out, no matter the election. In the, election, in the lectures, our speaker discusses the severity of this problem and, more importantly, demonstrates our current solutions, largely based on increasing awareness, um, are not really the correct methods to increase turnout. So we're going to learn what, what's best for us to do. So let me introduce our speaker. Our speaker this year is Professor Sunshine Hillegas. Dr. Hillegas is Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Duke University where she is also director of the Initiative on Survey Methodology and co-director of the Polarization Lab. Her research focuses on public opinion, political communication, political behavior, and survey methodology and has been funded by the National Science Foundation. She's a co-author of several books, including Making Young Voters, Converting Civic Attitudes into Civic Action, The Persuadable Voter, Wedge Issues in Presidential Campaigns, and The Hard Count, The Social and Political Challenges of Census Mobilization. And her book, The Persuadable Voter, won the 2009 Robert E. Lane Award for the best book in political psych psychology published in the previous year. Dr. Hillegas serves on the editorial boards of many professional journals and is associate editor of political analysis. She was associate PI of the American National Election Study, served on the U.S. Census Bureau's Scientific Advisory Committee, and was a member of the American National Election Studies Board. Dr. Hillegas has been recognized with numerous awards, honors, and grants, including the Henry Brenna David Endowment Award and Lecture at the National Academy of Sciences and the Howard D. Johnson Distinguished Teaching Award from Duke University. So please join me in virtually welcoming Professor Hillegas as the 2021 Rothbaum Lecturer in Representative Government. Sunshine. Hi, thank you. Um, and I, I just wanted to give a quick, you know, big thank you. Um, to the University of Oklahoma, the Carol Albert Center, Mike Crespin for um, making this happen. Of course, the, the Rothbaum family, the, the willingness to pivot um, to virtual, I know is not ideal. I know that everyone has kind of Zoom fatigue. Um, I hope though that um, this might be an opportunity for us to kind of kick off in some ways um, the, the recognition that, you know, there's, there's an election season coming up and um, the importance of, of young voters um, in that upcoming election is something that we can't start thinking about um, um, early enough. And so just again, want to say a big thank you before we get started. I, I know that, um, um, again, that would have much, been much better had I been there. I think my parents are the most disappointed because although Mike didn't mention it, um, I'm a University of Arkansas grad. I'm glad that nobody has, has mentioned the, the basketball game between Oklahoma and Arkansas um, through this process. But uh, my parents had planned to, to come over um, if I was going to be in the area and are, are disappointed not to have had that happen. So I hope there is another opportunity to, to make my way to Norman. Um, in the future and appreciate you guys all being here um, virtually and look forward to um, questions that, that you might have and, and um, you know, thinking about the, the next election cycle. 
Thanks, Sunshine. I will say one advantage of the, the Zoom lecture is we have participants from all across the country. So literally, uh, one in California, we have one in New York, we have Illinois, uh, and several others. So it's great to have the national scope here, uh, rather than focusing just here in Norman. Um, so now we'll show uh, an overview lecture, and then we'll return uh, to have the opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Hilligas about her research and what we can do to increase turnout among young voters. So Richard, if you could play the video for us now, thanks. Hi, I'm Sunshine Hilligas, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Duke University. It is a great honor uh, to be giving the Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecture in Representative Government at the University of Oklahoma. I want to first just give a big thank you to Mike Crespin, the director of the Carl Albert Center, the Rothbaum family for making this possible and for navigating the difficulty of doing all of this virtually. Today and in a series of lectures already posted on YouTube, I'm going to focus on understanding youth turnout in American elections. I'm going to be talking about my recent book with John Holbein, Making Young Voters, as well as new and ongoing research. I'm going to be giving you an overview today, but if you want to delve in any deeper with any of these topics, those lectures have already been posted online. I, I want to first start by explicitly making the case that this is an important topic. Some of you might think I'm a bit of a curmudgeon to talk about the problem of youth turnout. So you might have heard that there were historic levels of youth turnout in 2018 and 2020. Young voters were called the key to Biden's victory in 2020. 2020 was in fact called the year of the young voter. And this really builds on this surge in youth activism that we saw around protests, around racial injustice, uh, police brutality, um, in the run up to the 2018 election around mass shootings. And, and so these mass demonstrations and this virtual social media campaign really have focused attention on activism, activism among young people. A June 2020 poll of 18 to 29 year olds, for instance, found that 83% believe that young people had the power to change the country. I think that providing some context, though, will help you to understand why it is that I say that, that, that youth turnout is still a problem. Young people voted in historic levels in 2018, but that was from a change from about 21% in 2014 to 30% in 2018. So with the highest midterm level ever among young people, still two thirds stayed home. And it is true that youth turnout surged to 50% in 2020. It's a turnout rate to be celebrated for sure. But just know that the turnout rate among old people increased even more. So the reason I talk about low levels of youth turnout being a problem is because it is low and enduring this difference in turnout levels between young and older vo voters. So what I show here is the gap between young and old voters. The light blue line are those 65 plus. The dark blue line are young voters. And going back to 1986, we see that there has always been a gap of 25 percentage points, 40 percentage points. They're even bigger in midterm elections. and local elections, they can exceed 50 uh, percentage points. This dark line is the gap between young and old voters. The, the key point I want you to realize is this gap between young and old voters is larger than the gaps that we see by race and ethnicity, by socioeconomic status, and by any other way to categorize um, the population. This age gap um, is um, a problem that we need to address, and I'll be talking about over the course of these lectures. And not to pick on Oklahoma, but it turns out that Oklahoma has one of the lowest youth turnout rates in the country. So uh, according to a circle analysis of voter files and census data, just 34% of 18 to 29 year olds voted in 2020, 30% of those 18 to 24. Only the state of South Dakota had lower turnout. It is also the case that the gap between young and older voters is worse in the United States than any other advanced democracy. 
So this particular analysis shows analysis that we did um, from the comparative study of electoral systems. And the 34 countries in, in this study, um, the US had the largest gap between young and older voters. The key point I want to make is just that these turnout disparities have consequences. Beyond just kind of normative concerns about democratic participation, it's the case that these turnout gaps distort the policymaking process. So, you know, it's the case that if you have distortions in turnout, you also have distortions in representation. So, for instance, um, if we were to look at the um, electoral map from 2020, if only young people voted, it would be a much bluer map. But beyond those issues of representation, um, voting is also considered a, a measure of community vitality. It is about you know, social cohesion. It demonstrates it's a marker of social capital. It's also the case that political engagement and participation in democracy is a core mission of public education. So if we are not seeing young people vote, it's a, it's a marker also of the failure of our education system. Now, it, it is the case that, of course, all three of these things kind of apply to older voters as well. And it is true that turnout in the US is, in fact, lower across all age groups compared to a lot of democracy. But the last point that I would make is just that the reason that we should focus on young people more so than even older people is that this is our solution to improving turnout among all Americans. Because voting is habitual. So it turns out that if young people learn to vote, they stay voters as they age. OK, so why is it that more people, young people, don't vote? That's the you know, first key question that I want to address. The conventional wisdom is that young people are apathetic and disinterested, disengaged. Um, that you've probably seen the, you know, the, the headlines about millennials, right? That, that millennials are more concerned about taking selfies um, than uh, contributing to their communities. But the reality is, is if, if young people are just disinterested, then the solution to increasing youth turnout is to increase political interest. And in fact, that is the way that most youth advocacy groups focus their messaging. They want to make voting cool. They want to get young people engaged by telling them that something is at stake in the election. They want them to care more. They want to convince young people to run for office in hopes that that will get young people to care more about, um, about elections. But I want to make the case that youth turnout has been misdiagnosed. That, in fact, young people already care about politics. So um, this is using data from the American National Election Study going back to 1948. Regardless of the measure that we use, what we find is that young people do care about politics. Young people are interested. They do care who's going to win the election. And the numbers make it clear. So across time, and even more so in recent years, um, young people express an interest in elections. And when asked prior to um, the election, 81% on average say that they are likely to vote. And yet they don't. So this dark line here, the dotted line is their intention to vote. The dark line is actual turnout. This gap between their intention to vote and their actual vote is what we call a follow through gap. And we think that this is the real problem that needs to be addressed. It's not that young people are disinterested in politics. Rather, they fail to follow through on their civic attitudes and intentions. So the key to understanding and solving youth turnout is identifying why it is young people don't follow through on their intentions. And I want to point out that this is uniquely young people. It's the case that the gap between intention to vote and behavior is much larger for young people than older people. OK, so, so this is a, a different perspective 
than the, the common um, narrative out there. Um, and, and the question then is why? The fact is, is that um, some people do follow through. And what we discovered is that those who do follow through um, have what are so-called non-cognitive skills. Um, it turns out that the translation of attitudes and intentions into behavior is not so different in the civic domain than in any other domain. So where you might have outside intentions relative to your behaviors, whether it's exercising or eating healthy or studying for an exam, the people who are best able to fall follow through, have self-regulation, effortfulness, and interpersonal skills. We were the first to show that these non-cognitive skills matter for voting. Now, there's a whole literature out there um, in education, policy, and economics, in childhood development, and psychology that has focused on these non-cognitive skills and made the case that they are important for explaining academic and life success. Um, they, this is you know, an incredibly interesting uh, line of research because it shows that these skills are teachable, they develop in adolescence, the interventions can be effective in making young people um, have better skills, um, but nobody had, had yet looked to see if it matters for voting. So once we know that the solution, that the problem is about follow through, rather than about a lack of interest, then it changes how we think about um, policy solutions. So in my lectures, I get into two different uh, ways that we can use this uh, new perspective uh, to think about policy solutions. So you know, first, let's keep in mind what is not a policy solution the scholars and activists and celebrities, right, who, who have made the case that we need to increase youth turnout by getting young people to care more, you know, that's not the thing that's going to be effective. So instead, we think there are two key pathways. Um, first, civic education reforms to increase capacity of young people to follow through. And the other are electoral reforms so that we lower the obstacles. So, before I talk just very briefly to give you some um, sense of the, the lectures that, that have been posted online about these policy reforms, I first want to, to get to an explanation of why it is that young people um, might be less inclined to follow through than older people. Keep in mind that young people are coming to voting age at a time in their life when they are transient and unstable. I compare, you know, if you have a nine to five job like most, you know, adults and you have to think about, you know, how it is you're going to vote on the second Tuesday of November, then that's a different um, challenge than if you're a college student who has a, an entirely variable schedule um, and um, oftentimes can't, you know, uh, know what that schedule looks like the, the next week. So part of it is stage in life. So part of it is just a function of, of where young people are when they're coming of age. But part of it are about the electoral rules, the, the rules that govern when and where and how new voters are able to register and vote. And so, you know, I want to make the case that just because we show that there's a relationship between these non-cognitive skills and voter turnout, is not meant to imply that young people just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Part of the policy solution is that we need to make it easier for young people to register and vote. The reason there's a relationship between non-cognitive skills and turnout is because registration and voting is so hard in this country. So, two policy solutions, one school reforms, the other electoral reforms. In that first realm, um, if you uh, watch the lecture where I get into this more, our key point is to say that it's not just the amount of civic education in this country that needs to change, um, that we need a fundamental rethinking of civic education. Right now we have what I would call 
bubble sheet civics. Um, there's too much time spent on rote memorization of facts and figures from history and government. Um, and that is not relevant necessarily to the actual mechanics of registration and voting. And too often um, that gets ignored. So, so we need to, to teach about the actual process of registration and voting. We need to develop non cognitive skills needed for participation. So the example I like to give is to say, you know, it's probably more useful rather than memorizing the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to instead, you know, uh, teach students what to do if they show up at the polling location and their name isn't on the voter roll. We also need to talk about actual politics in school. And um, this is a, a, a tricky thing to, um, to, to broach, and I'll talk more about it in, in that um, lecture. But the reality is, is that right now, talking about history doesn't necessarily connect to the political debates today. And we need to do a much better job of that. A second policy change we need is to make registration and voting easier. We show that when registration and voting are easier, young people are more likely to turn out. Election rules matter. So residency rules, registration deadlines, voter identification requirements, the location of polling places, all vary widely across states and have a bigger impact on new and young voters than older ones. In lecture number three, I talk about the effective laws and how politicians are making a mistake if they turn electoral reform into a partisan issue. Ultimately, my key take home message from this series of lectures is that the work that needs to be done to increase youth turnout is not going to happen during an election campaign. Fundamentally, what matters more than candidates, the issues, the efforts of the advocacy groups, the work we do between elections to try and reform our election laws and our civics education curriculum. I hope you'll join me um, for the lectures and for Q&A and look forward to seeing you at least virtually um, a, a live to, to answer questions. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, so that was an overview of the uh, set of lectures that Dr. Hillegas has put together. And now we have some time to ask some questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, I have some I'm going to ask to kick us off. Uh, so you know, my first question is, uh, I, I'm a college professor. I routinely teach 250 students in an introduction to American government class every year. Um, it, if I could teach, if I could spend one week, so two lectures on this topic, what should I do? How should I, what should I do now that maybe I wasn't doing in the past? Sure. I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is, is my hunch, maybe this is a required class, but, um, you know, I don't necessarily get access to the people who need to hear the most, right, that we need to reach the most. So political science majors, and frankly, even college students, like we can't start there. Part of um, the, the research we've done really emphasizes the point that we need to start earlier um, than college, right, that, that we can really push this back even further. So, so let me first just you know emphasize that that I really think you know high school teachers and middle school teachers that, that that's where that's where we should focus some attention. As a college professor, however, um, I think we take for granted that because we have opinionated, um, informed, and engaged students, that they are also doing the things that are necessary to register to vote. Um, and the reality is, is that all of us need to double check that those incredibly politically sophisticated students are in fact following through on um, the actual process of registration and voting. And um, I think this comes down to, you know, thinking about and, and reminding students um, of filling out the registration, um, you know, forms, um, you know, maybe as part of your class, if that's possible, although Oklahoma doesn't have online registration, so that makes it a little bit more um, yeah, difficult. Um, but, but removing the barriers to participation whenever there's an opportunity, because too often what we're finding evidence of, and this is in quantitative research as well as qualitative research, um, that the intent is there, the interest is there, um, but too often it's just a matter of 
you know, the registration deadline passed or there was confusion about, you know, how, like if you were allowed to register to vote, if you, you know, are not trying to register at your parents' house um, or it's unclear, right? What, you know, whether your, your student ID is going to work um, as a form of a voter ID. Those, those um, just practical, uh, topics about process are something that I think need more attention um, in the classroom and, and, and probably for college students as well. There is incredible variation across colleges in terms of how much universities essentially um, help the process to get students um, registered. And, and I would love for it to be the case that it, it, they don't have to wait until they show up in your classroom. That is part of the orientation process to get students registered when they step on campus for the first time. I'll let you shout the orientation part to our group that runs orientation on campus. That's always been a goal of ours at the Colbert Center is to hit the orientation, right? Sort of make it, you know, sort of a, a required part of things you do. Um, I would say, you know, after watching the other lectures as well, um, I'm convinced I'm going to change what I do. So what I used to do was, you know, hey, here's some forms. If you want to register, you can take one, you know, maybe turn it back in at the end. But it seems like a better thing to do and say, all right, I'm handing out forms to everybody. We're going to walk through on my screen. Here's how you fill it out. And uh, there's some questions on the form that are not hard, but students are afraid of getting it wrong. I think they're afraid of making mistakes. Uh, so talking through those with them, you know, in Oklahoma, there's one that says, where were you registered last? And that stumps a lot of students. So I think doing it in class would be, be helpful. Um, so I would just add to that. Um, I think having that assistance ends up being key because we do know that young people are more likely to have their registration forms and their mail in voting um, ballots rejected more than any other um, group in the electorate. And there was one study that we report on um, in our book that 50% of young people in one class made a mistake on their registration forms. And, and many of those were ones that would have led to a rejection. And so, you know, you consider, for instance, and, and again, I talk about this um, in the lecture on electoral rules, but if you have a state where there's a exact match required in names, um, I go by Sunshine, which was my, my legal middle name. Um, and if I signed in that way, then it might not match to what my ID um, says, and that could, could end up with a rejection in some states. And so those are the type of process and practical pieces of, of the, the registration and voting process that, you know, frankly, it varies across states so much that it's actually not an easy task to have one person even know what all of the, the rules are. And it, it really is, um, makes it even more challenging when you're dealing with students who are crossing state lines. Um, and, and a lot of the students that, that we ended up talking to in qualitative interviews who were you know, active and engaged and, and participating in, in many different ways, um, ultimately said they, they, were, they were just, confused if they were even allowed to vote because, you know, they they kept their parents' address for their permanent address. And and there's just a lot of confusion over over these rules. Yeah, I think there's a myth that, you know, you your uh, where you register to vote has to match your driver's license and these sorts of and that's usually not the case. It's usually not, although in some states, right, Michigan okay. just changed that law. And so mm -hmm. um, that's that's one of the reasons that I think, you know, it, at the end of the day, as I talk about in terms of electoral rules, this variation across states, as well as the changes that we're seeing with hundreds of laws that are being passed at the state level to make changes in, in um, the electoral rules. Sometimes in, during the pandemic, some of those rules were intended to make voting easier, but the, 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 the cumulative impact is that it is creating considerable uncertainty and confusion about exactly what the rules are, and in fact, making the jobs more difficult for some advocacy groups. And, and um, I, in fact, found that, so North Carolina is very familiar um, with changes in election laws. Um, we have had voter ID, it's been taken away by the courts. We had pre-registration, it was uh, taken away and then reinstated by the courts. And um, I had a youth advocacy group tell me that they stayed out of the state um, one election season because they just didn't know what the rules of the game were. And it was easier to spend their money in a state where there was clarity about what they could do 
um, in terms of, of pre-registration. So this uh, talking about reform sets up one of the questions in the chat from uh, Professor Finnecaro. Uh, so his understanding at some of the past efforts to lower barriers to voting like Motor Voter, uh, which actually I think was promoted a lot by MTV, the celebrities, uh, really didn't increase turnout. So could you say a little bit about your evidence? Um, I think it was in the third lecture. Uh, why lowering barriers is likely to work in engaging young people. Sure, and and I think I, I that's a perfect like kind of setup for those who are familiar with the political science literature that that most of the refrain has been, you know, these election rules maybe they matter and and you know we see these differences cross nationally that you know maybe that's about election rules, but on the other hand, you know, a lot of the empirical analysis finds rather limited evidence, um, and what we end up doing is is comparing across different types of electoral reforms and. For instance, early voting doesn't matter. Um, and so what, what we find evidence of is essentially the rules, the electoral reforms that allow people to procrastinate <laughs> are the ones that are kind of most effective um, at having an actual causal impact um, on, on turnout. And so pre registration and the ones that this, this um, for those of you who are kind of familiar with the political science literature, um, it really is kind of in the same vein as, as the Barry Burden research that, that's about if you can, it, the rules that expand the electorate rather than just um, making things more convenient for, for existing um, uh, voters tend to be the things that, that have the largest impact on, on voter turnout. And Motor Voter is, is I think, a, a classic example that I use in terms of um, when uh, politicians and, and uh, you know, scholars and, and policy advocates um, end up making assumptions about the policy, the partisan implications um, of electoral reforms. Motor voter is one of those that people thought would be this, you know, great boon for, for Democrats. Um, and in fact, you know, after motor voter, you have Republican uh, takeover of Congress and, and more Republican presidential administrations and Democratic ones. And so, you know, I think it highlights the fact that that both the assumptions about um, the partisan impact of a given electoral reform are things that that really deserve empirical study and, and should not be what is motivating um, our election rules in this country. And two, that it's not just a matter of blanket everything, you know, that any reform is, is necessarily um, better. So the, the, the reforms that had the biggest impact on young people, online registration, pre-registration, um, it's the things that, and, and I would imagine that automatic registration, once we have kind of sufficient time to be able to evaluate that would be a, another one that kind of follows um, from, from that, that logic. Um, but it's really things that are removing the barrier to voter registration so that, you know, when, when um, the voter, you know, realizes, oh, wait, election day is next week. Um, I didn't realize I was supposed to, you know, register to vote, um, you know, two weeks ago, um, that, that there's still an opportunity uh, to vote. So uh, this wasn't in your lectures and, and it wasn't in your book, and hopefully it'll be in the, the forthcoming book for the Rothbaum series. Um, you know, we saw a lot of changes related to COVID, and a lot of those ex really expanded and made, I think made it easier to vote. You know, I think um, some states uh, had, ma you know, mail-in vote. Everyone got their ballot mailed to them. Um, other states had sort of incremental changes. Um, is there any evidence? Uh, have you had a chance to analyze any of the, you know, the 2020 data uh, where we had lots of variation, which is also helpful for testing hypotheses? Yeah, I mean, this, and, and this is kind of the intent of some of the research going um, going forward is is to look more carefully um, at the impact of COVID on young people in particular. And, and while um, it's hard, it's hard because there were so many changes that overlapped at the same time. Um, and so, for instance, the evidence that I've, I've looked at so far in terms of early voting and mail in voting is that it has no impact on young people. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, that analysis was pre-COVID. And so we do need to evaluate if in the context you know, of, of a pandemic, if that made a difference. I will say that, that one of the things I think is fascinating about COVID is that so many of the rules that were put in place um, were ones that, you know, if we don't call them discriminatory towards young people, at very least, they were, they were um, rules that made it easier for older people to vote 
um, that were not available to young people in all states. So for instance, a lot of the states that took away requirements for mail-in voting did so for senior citizens um, and not for um, all voters. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when there was kind of um, efforts made, um, it really was kind of focused on um, older voters more so um, than young voters. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I would say in terms of, of COVID um, is that it, it also, um, I think that one of the most fascinating parts of the story that hasn't yet been explored, and I, I'm, I'm in the process of, of working on a little bit of research in this area, is the impact it had on college students. So, um, you know, um, I, I was so excited to see that so many of the youth advocacy groups that, you know, are part of, of the Carol Albert Center in, in Oklahoma had this connection to the census as well. And, you know, because um, to me, census and, um, you know, civic participation through voting, you know, go hand in hand. Um, but, but college campuses shut down, right? Right in the midst of, of when we were trying to count but also right in the midst of when you would normally start kind of seeing efforts to um, have students register to vote. And the, the impact of um, changes in residency um, and um, you know, what that meant for um, you know, whether young people applied for an absentee ballot versus not are all things that I think are, are fascinating topics that, that are deserving of attention. There certainly is um, you know, variation across um, schools in terms of when they shut down, when they reopened, um, that I think will will potentially offer some leverage for, um, you know, really unpacking, you know, you know, we saw this, this historic level of, of youth turnout in 2020, you know, what could it have been, you know, in, um, you know, had, had we also had, um, you know, what could it have been in Oklahoma, if Oklahoma had online registration? If Oklahoma didn't, you know, have pretty daunting requirements for doing mail-in voting, um, these are, these are the type of things that I think are really important questions to, to ask and and uh, really get at my my point that like you know this isn't this isn't just um, an election season type of problem. It's it's the type of thing that we we ought to be thinking about now in terms of what are the policies that might have impact. I, I know we, we struggle with, you know, students would ask, should, especially during COVID, should I register in Norman? Are we going to be back home with my parents? And for a lot of our students, that's North Texas. So we, you know, we're actually pretty familiar with the Texas laws, so we have to learn both. Um, you know, should I register in Norman and request an absentee? I think a lot of people think an absentee is, you know, for, only for special reasons. Um, Oklahoma is no excuse absentee, just check a box and they send a ballot to you. Um, although to send it in can be difficult, um, you either need um, a notarized signature, that's what you need now, and during COVID, they let you, the, the special case was you could send in a copy of your ID, of course you have to find a printer, uh, which is not the easiest thing. So I, I would note, and I've made this case to policymakers in Oklahoma, um, so we slightly reduced um, the barriers to registration and voting, and Republicans, uh, gained. They gained seats and they gained in votes. So I think that emphasizes your sort of, you know, this, there's not necessarily a partisan uh, advantage to loosening uh, or making it easier to vote. Yeah. And, and when you think of, I mean, so, so, you know, when you think about these barriers of, okay, you know, Oklahoma doesn't have online registration. I mean, you can fill out the form online, but you still have to print it and then put a stamp on it. And I mean, you know, I hope some college students might be here who can back me up like a stamp, right? Like, <laughs> you know, who, like, who, like, I haven't used a stamp in so long, right? Like, we do everything online. And this idea that you have to gather together, I, I mean, the notarization process is, is pretty crazy, right? But even just requiring the printing of your ID and a stamp is also something that is um, uh, pretty, pretty, I think, Makes, makes it easy to see why it is who somebody who has absolute intent um, to, to participate might not you know, get, get that pulled across the finish line. Yeah, I know we, we, we try to um, provide stamps or, you know, hey, we'll, we'll mail these in for you. And I think that, you know, that probably helps for a lot of students. They can drop off their forms. We have two notaries in the office. You know, we need to, to notarize something. Um, so uh, there's an, another question I, I touched on partisan politics a little bit. 
Um, this is from a grad student here, uh, Benny Ashton. Uh, so do young people tend to be more or less turned off by the polarizing and often conflictual nature of contemporary politics? Um, you know, when teaching about the political process, do you have any advice on how to avoid turning young voters off to politics without sort of sugarcoating and, and avoiding things? Yeah, and, and actually this is another part of the topic that I we didn't get in, into that my book with John Holbein and is, is really um, where I'm taking, taking this focus on young people is that um, there is this fascinating discrepancy um, that I see. The you know, first it, 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 it came out in my conversation with young people where um, I kept hearing um, young people say, I was going to vote, but then I, I didn't get around to doing as much research as I thought that I should. And I don't wanna be an uninformed voter. And there is, and so digging into the data that are available, which is, is not very much, what I found is that you know young people um, absolutely right are turned off by partisan polarization. And the consequence of that is that they view party voting as like a bad thing, right? Whereas whereas we as political scientists and and frankly older Americans view party voting as a, a, a you know a way that we can make decisions without having to do much research, right? Like it because it's a heuristic. Party is a heuristic. You don't have to you don't have to search the entire country for the one candidate who's going to best represent your interests. You just decide is the D or the R in the city council race in the you know like the dog catcher race like that you don't have to do extensive research to be able to represent your interests. Um, but there's such kind of um, you know negative uh, association with par party polarization and just you know voting party that young people are quite reluctant to do that. And so the other place that that kind of jumps out. It was in his um, Huff poll, uh, pollster poll that was done, and and they just asked the question, you know, should all Americans vote, um, or should you only vote if you're, you know, well informed? And um, older uh, Americans, they said, you know, everyone should vote. Not younger Americans. Only forty percent said that that all Americans should vote. There is a sense that um, that young that I think that young people hold themselves to too high of a standard in terms of the information that is required to be a good voter. Um, so that um, I, I personally think this is my hypothesis is, is probably an artifact of our current information environment where you know you could you could do research every minute of every day and still not know everything about every candidate and every um, issue. Um, also the way we teach civics, um, right, is very focused on political knowledge. Um, but I, I think one of the biggest misperceptions that we as educators and, and institutions of higher education and high schools need to better communicate um, that it is okay, right, that, that you just need to show up, that it's not hard to, um, to vote in a way that, that represents your self-interest, that it's not necessary. And, and, and that's not saying I'm advocating for people to, you know, not do more research about the, the, the issues. Um, but I think if we, we focus on the reality of this discrepancy between what old people think they need to know and what young people think they need to know, that it helps to um, understand this kind of internal barrier to participation that, that's keeping young, some young people home. Um, so all that is to say, yes, young people are turned off by polarization. Um, and and um, again, going back to this point that this is not a partisan um, issue at all, um, is just, you know, young people um, are more likely to change their votes um, across election cycles. They're more likely to change their mind within a given um, election. Um, when I was uh, doing work on pre-registration laws in particular, um, this was part of the litigation um, that reinstated pre-registration in North Carolina. The, the, the uh, pre-registration laws increased registration among those who are unaffiliated more than either uh, Democrats or Republicans. And that's a really consistent kind of finding that when you expand, right, like these electoral reforms that kind of expand the electorate are, are helping to bring in people who are not kind of the, the party um, loyalists. And, and so 
um, again, these are this is why it is, is really not a, a partisan issue to say that we need to, to make it possible for young people to, to, to participate. I, I think that finding makes sense when we think about the people who maybe have the, who think they have the most to gain from voting are the you know, strong partisans on, on both sides. So when you reduce the cost, the people who maybe, you know, they think they have less to gain, it's probably not a correct thought, um, but maybe the less invested. Um, you know, they're, they're going to sign up when you lower uh, the barriers. Um, I, I would add, uh, when I talk to my students about voting, and I say, like, look, I'm a political scientist. Um, I should know a lot about this. I get to the bottom of the ticket. I don't know who some of these people are. Yeah. And, you know, we have a lot of, you know, you mentioned city council. Our, ours is actually, you know, there's no party ID. Um, so it's a little bit of guessing. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't followed along, if you have followed along, at least in Norman, it's very obvious uh, I think the sides of some of our, our candidates. We've had very contentious uh, city council uh, elections. Um, so here, here, here's another question from the chat. Um, and I might add a little bit to this. Do you see a relationship between young voters engagement and familial relationships? Um, so uh, young people's opinions are sometimes very different from the parents or grandparents. Um, and maybe young people think their votes won't matter when their uh, families consistently express different opinions. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit of a political science-y follow-up is this, to this. Um, is, it, is any of this genetic? You know, this talk about grit, right? Um, I, you talk about it can be taught, um, but it is, is any of it inherent? Um, so I'll, I'll give the first part again. So, you know, do you think young people are concerned about their parents uh, and maybe canceling each other out? That, that was the question from the chat. And mine was the genetic part. Okay, yeah. So those are very different questions, I would say. But let me let me tackle both of them. And and, and actually, um, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting thing about this this link between parents and young and, and kids um, is well established, right? And and the single biggest predictor of turnout for young people is did they come from a politically engaged family? And in fact, that's one of the reasons that uh, we focus so much attention on high schools is because we need to be sure and reach the people who, who can't, I mean, so many of the young people that we talked to, they were like, oh, I called my dad because I wasn't sure exactly, you know, what I needed to do in filling out my absentee, to request my absentee ballot, right? So, so, so young people are leaning very heavily on, on families in terms of navigating the rules for registration and voting. Um, and, and the, the key is, you know, we need to be able to reach and make sure that we are not making it the case, right, that it's only the, 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 the kids of active um, uh, families that are the only ones who are, are participating. It's more interesting, this question of the link between parents' attitudes and turnout, and I don't know that anybody's actually studied the impact on turnout, right, like people have looked at the relationship between the attitudes of the kids and the attitudes of the parents. Um, and yes, while there's plenty of people who disagree, um, there, you know, there also are, of course, um, some strong connections. But, but I actually think it's a, a quite interesting hypothesis to, to think about how it might also impact um, participation. Um, on the questions of genetics, um, so um, you know, first off, that is a very um, uh, you know, fraught, <laughs> I would say, a question, you know, topic. Um, sure, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think a bit, you know, now how, um, you know, when I read even the, the you know, genetics literature on, on ideology and, and stuff, and, and, and just think like that was such a, in my view, like a very dangerous, not well handled, frankly, line of literature that largely we don't see, I, you know, like it, it hasn't, Kind of burgeoned in the way that I think it has fundamentally shaped what people um, think about in within public opinion necessarily. Um, but um, some of our research is we were using um, longitudinal um, study, every longitudinal long term longitudinal study that we could get our hands on that included some measure of you know grit or non cognitive skills as well as some measure of turnout later in life. Um, or could be matched to voter files in a way that we could we could look at at connections to turnout. Um, these data sets, things like Ad Health, um, the Wisconsin um, Adolescent Health Study, um, several of these were actually large enough 
um, that the way that we got kind of causal, some causal leverage out of this observational data was to look at sibling um, and even in twin um, uh, fixed effects. And so, you know, not to get into the weeds of, of, um, of you know, uh, the statistics, um, but I think the important conclusion is to say, even amongst siblings or twins, when you have a twin that has higher levels of non-cognitive skills, that twin turns out at a higher rate. So, um, you know, I don't think we explicitly calculated, you know, what, what percentage somebody might kind of attribute to genetics, but the important thing for us is to say that is absolutely valuable, um, you know, in terms, it's, it's been shown to be um, able to, to um, be uh, better developed, and importantly, right, like, you know, being the being the twin that has better that has more grit, right, pays off um, at, at the ballot box. So certainly, it's not, um, you know, again, like I, I don't want the takeaway here. I, I think is that this this is worth investment from an education policy standpoint, um, and um, and and some of the the studies that have been done, not looking at turnout necessarily. Um, but, but just looking at, you know, grit and non-cognitive skills um, has, has delved into this a little bit more deeply than, than we have. Um, so there's a sort of a question on how things work that was answered a little bit in the chat, but I'll, I'll let you talk about what your research says. Um, so how does pre-registration work? Um, so, you know, is that the same across all the states? Is there variation? And what does your research tell us about uh, pre-registration? Sure, I, I think this is one of the most important um, policies out there um, in terms of, of impact on um, improving youth turnout. And the reason is because a couple of different things. So number one is that there is incredible variation. A lot of states, it's, it's at 16 is when you can fill out your registration form. And that way, when you turn 18, you don't have to fill it out again, um, and, and, you know, unless you've moved. In Oklahoma, technically there's pre-registration, but it's not really that, you know, um, liberal of a, you know, it's not that generous of a, um, a benefit. So, so if you're 17 and a half, you're able to register to vote. The important thing about pre-registration, so most, um, so in the case of Oklahoma, frankly, there's not that, there's a very small pool of people who can actually take advantage because, because it's so late, 17 and a half, most of the kids that are going to pre pre register are also in most states would be eligible to regular register because they would be 18 by the time they reach the election. Mm -hmm. So the the pool of people who are able to pre register but not actually vote in the next election is is relatively small and it's why the 17 and a half is is kind of a weird and not super helpful threshold. In contrast, if you're 16, you're in high school in civics class, and that civics class is covering a range of ages, right? Then every single kid in that class, right, is able to fill out the same form and remove the registration barrier. That becomes really important because right now in most states that don't have pre-registration, your eligibility to fill out the registration form, right, depends on the, the timing of the next election which where we looked at this was in the state of North Carolina, because of, of primaries, you had like incredible variation across district, you know, like across counties, across cities, because the next election, right, varied depending on, you know, what the local uh, election was. And, and you could pre, you know, you could, re when there was no pre-registration, you could register like a different pool of, of kids um, could register in each county depending on what was going to be um, on the ballot. So pre-registration, I think, um, is is particularly effective um, both because it removes that pre -reg that registration hurdle, and it does so for kids um, when they're more likely to be paying attention to politics. So the the key, the people who are kind of most affected, are the 16 and 17 year olds in a presidential election that 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 can fill out the registration form. In a, pre, in a presidential election, right? Because when there's lots more attention about politics, um, but they can't actually vote yet. So the next midterm rolls around and 
they don't have to read, you know, they don't have to register 30 days in advance. And that becomes key in, in increasing their turnout in those midterm elections. Um, and midterm elections is where we see just such a dramatic drop off um, in, in terms of turnout that, um, you know, that's, that's, I think that's a spot where pre-registration especially pays off. The other thing that is nice about pre-registration, again, is, is it, it allows um, high schools as an institution to really be engaged in um, registration um, without having to worry about, you know, those, those arbitrary, you know, um, um, you know, across, you know, across elections, right, you would have a different date um, and a different um, group of students just because of variation in, in election day. And in fact, um, what we found in the state of Florida is that the, the, the biggest bang for the buck where you had the, the biggest causal effect on turnout were in counties um, when they implemented pre-registration that also had in-class demonstrations um, about the process of voting by the local registrar. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the push, what we would really love to see more is not a, you know, table in the cafeteria that has a registration form that somebody can come up to and, and fill out, but in class um, activities um, with a teacher able to, to answer questions um, and a discussion of what the actual process um, is like. So that, you know, we, we've talked a lot about registration. So, you know, that makes people eligible to vote. And you touched a little bit as, on your closing there about actually getting people to vote. Um, is there anything else we can do to close? I'm going to call it the grit gap, uh, right? So, hey, you know, I can stand there in class and say, please fill out this form, but getting them to actually show up on election day, if that's how they're going to decide to vote, is, is a whole other process that really can't be supervised the way registration can. Are there other things that high school teachers or college professors could be doing to help with the next step? Well, may, may, maybe part of what we can talk about, and, and I don't want to, you know, um, say that I'm just advocating for, you know, the legislation that was that was out there at the federal level, but but the other thing I would say is, um, you know, what what is one of the, re you know, if we, we say we take registration off the table, registration, we get everyone registered, or maybe we get rid of registration, you know, a lot of countries don't even have registration. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, what are some of the sources of variation that then have an impact? Things like location of the polling place. And, you know, the reality is, is that there have been um, deliberate efforts in some areas of the country to do things like split college campuses, um, you know, across different electoral districts because they, you know, they didn't want college students to have, you know, a big impact um, in, in one particular um, area. And so, so that, again, creates some confusion when you and your friend are both planning to go vote, but you have different polling locations after, you know, after class, you have, you have to go to different places. And, um, and so the distance to the polling location, the presence of a polling location on campus. Um, so uh, for instance, the state of Florida tried to pass a, a law to not allow polling locations on college campuses. That was eventually turned over by the courts, but then a new law was passed that said, okay, um, we're not gonna ban uh, polling locations on college campuses, but we are gonna pass a law that says you have to have sufficient number of parking spaces um, mm -hmm. available for that polling location. It doesn't matter if cars are not allowed, right, on campus for those college students. Um, you have to have, you know, parking spaces available. So, um, so, so it's not to say that there are, you know, every uh, cause of low youth turnout is attributable to the rules of the game, but I do think that we need to think about um, the rules of the game and how they can make it more complicated for, for young people um, than, than is necessary, frankly, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, yep. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know we, we tried to um, try to bring a polling place to campus. And so we, we faced the not enough parking spaces. We said, okay, we got this basketball arena. You know, it, it can, it's huge, plenty of parking. Um, and then, you know, they're kept on being a little bit more pushback of you won't be able to staff it. No problem, we can staff it. We have people, um, you know, trying to get changes like this is, is incredibly hard. And, you know, it might be a little bit harder in red state because what you said is there's a fear that, you know, it's going to increase, you know, maybe 
uh, Democratic voting as opposed to Republican voting. But the research says that's probably, you know, probably not the case. Right. Uh, I mean, and particularly, I mean, when you, you know, yes, it's true that that um, that the state, you know, the electoral map would have been bluer, but there were still, you know, there are definitely states where still the majority of young people voted for Trump or it was really frigging close. And so, you know, I think I think that there is just this um, misperception um, by policymakers um, ab about um, about young people that I, you know, again, I think it's it's uh, it's so important. It's been one of the um, hardest things to see with this research is to see just how much there has been this partisan polarization about something that should be, we should all be in agreement about. So speaking speaking of partisan polarization, uh, there's a question, and I think this is just what the gist of the question, um, what, what can the federal government do? Um, and then part, part of this question is focused on too, of maybe young people who are moving between states. So is there a way to make, you know, can the federal government help people who are, especially young people who frequently move? Yeah, I mean, what, well, so there's a, what could they do? That is very different from what, you know, sure. they appear capable of doing recently. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, you know, I want to be, I want to be careful and not say I like, you know, I think it's a little bit unfortunate that, um, you know, the the proposed legislation to to try and create some federal standards, which I think creating some federal standards is super, super important. I'm, I'm not sure that it was necessary to tackle everything in a single bill. And, and I, I, I wonder if we would have found more common ground and, and made more progress um, picking off, you know, some pieces um, of, uh, of the legislation. Um, but you know, at the federal government, I you know, I, the variation across states really does complicate so much for young people who are crossing state lines, um, and it um, is complicating things for advocacy groups. It is complicated, and, and you know, I um, there are some things that that can have national standards. Um, at the end of the day, right? Um, we're a federal system, and so, so you know, there. Th this is one consequence, I think, um, in that that you know we're not we're not going to be able to you know fix it um, fix it all. Um, but but I do think right that that pushing this topic is important, um, and um, I I hope that it doesn't kind of go away as a um, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the thing that it, that you know is has been frustrating to watch is just to see all of this attention about young people, but it's so short lived, and it's during election season, and then it goes away. And you know, even the funding for most advocacy organizations, right? Like they they they're working on you know slim budgets, and that everything goes into. Um, the election season, and that just isn't that isn't going to pay off in the way that um, kind of sustained uh, focus on on electoral reform will. Yeah, maybe maybe spend a little bit less on campaign ads uh, and a little bit more uh, year round on you know keeping these coalitions together because uh, they they tend to ebb and flow. You know, I think you need. I don't want to brag on the Albert Center, but places like the Albert Center that work on this all the time, um, right? And so there's a constant stream of students that come in and people like Lauren, who you're going to talk to and some of the other people you'll talk to tomorrow, um, you know, they try to keep that going uh, year after year, not, not just in our um, election years. So um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, is there any words of wisdom you want to leave us with? You know, there's a number of college professors and students here. Um, I'll, I'll offer you the closing remarks. <laughs> well, you know, I guess I guess the thing that I would say is I um, there are a, a few different things, uh, particularly for those who are involved in research, um, is that um, it is I think important that we recognize that as a field. Um, that, and, and, and I'm guilty of this as well, is that we have focused attention, I think, um, in some ways in the wrong places, right? That, that focusing attention on, you know, campaign effects, whether, you know, on, um, you know, things that I've spent a lot of my career focusing on, 
um, is not where there's necessarily going to have the biggest um, impact in terms of American democracy. And it's, it's not just outside of the campaign season, but it's also looking young, like looking at, at the development of young people, their civic engagement starting much younger. When I think about there, there's really, you know, not sufficient data out there um, in the field for us to have a robust um, research agenda about the development um, of young people. And, and so these, you know, these questions that people had about the connection between uh, families and 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 youth and the connection between um, you know uh, school experiences and youth and 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 even the you know the development of these non cognitive skills these are all things that that really require us to invest in studying adolescents right invest in studying um, schools in a way that as a field we haven't necessarily done enough and and so you know my my message to those who are, um, you know, wanting to, to have an impact is, you know, yes, elections are fun and, and, and great, um, but, you know, focus on, on lobbying and, and focus on school reform. And then to the, the researchers, um, I would say, you know, focus on the development um, of, um, you know, uh, of adolescents and, and you know, the, the, the school system and, and that that is a body of work that um, we desperately need some, some more attention to. And, and the work that, that I've done so far really has been um, pulling together um, research from childhood development and psychology and, and economics where there has been far more attention to, um, you know, uh, young uh, people. Um, but I think that, that it's time for political scientists to, to uh, contribute um, as well. Well, great, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, just join me and we can virtually uh, thank Dr. Hillegas here. Um, and then we ask you if you wanna join us tomorrow, we're gonna have a round table. So the round table is gonna be with Dr. Hillegas, um, as well as people who um, like Lauren Schuler and others who sort of work to register and turn out young people on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So it'll be much more practical uh, than theoretically focused today. And if you see in the chat, you can see the link to tomorrow's Zoom. Just a reminder, tomorrow is earlier. It's at noon. Uh, we had a, a one thirty start today. So thanks everyone for joining us. I, I appreciate everyone. Uh, appreciate your questions and your attention today. Thank you. <laughs>